Okay, chapter two. This chapter is shorter than the last one. Legend has it that John Wilkes Booth was hiding out inside the shadows near the front door of Ford's as the president's carriage rocked down the dirt street and showed, slowed. Wherever he was, it is almost certain that he somehow watched with his own eyes to be certain that the Lincolns were actually inside the theater. And he probably wondered whether other guests in the box were, were the type who would pose a threat to his plans. It didn't matter, really. No one was going to stop him from going through with it. It was now 9 p.m., time for Booth to go inside the theater for the first time since the Lincolns had arrived. Although the actor had entered the theater after the performance started, he was still on schedule. The play was like a clock. Every word spoken was another tick of the second hand. After hearing some familiar dialogue, Booth knew, Booth would know, to the minute, how much time remained in, his perform in the performance. He knew that he had at least another hour. He left Ford's. A little while, in a little while, he returned to his alley stable where he had left his rented horse, a bay mare. He led the horse down the alley by the reins to the back door of Ford's theater. He asked theater employee Edmund Spangler to hold his horse for him. Spangler said he was too busy moving scenery. Another theater employee named John Peanut for the snack he sold to theater patrons held the reins of Booth's restless horse while the actor went inside. Once inside Ford's, Booth wanted to cross behind the stage on the other side of the build to the other side of the building where the door led to a narrow passageway that ran to the front of the theater. Booth asked an employee if he could sneak across the stage concealed by scenery. That was impossible, he was told, as a scene that required the full stage was being performed and there was nowhere to hide from the audience by creeping behind the scenery. Instead, Booth would have to cross under the stage and emerge on the other side. Can you imagine the um, boldness that this guy has. Like, if you've been to a play and you see, like, there's different parts of scenery across the back of the stage, he's thinking that to get to the president, he can just sneak behind each piece of scenery and cross the actual stage where the play is going on. Like, this guy's a little off his rocker. Um, Booth lifted the trap door and dropped down into darkness. He could hear the wooden planks of the stage creaking overhead, the distant muffled voices of the actors and laughter from the audience. He climbed the stairs at the end of the passageway, nudged open the trap door, and entered the area that ran lengthwise between Ford's and the saloon next door. He emerged on 10th Street. Anyone who saw him now would assume he had come down 10th Street to take, the pl take in the play. No one in the theater except a few employees knew he had a horse waiting out back. There was time for one last drink. Booth walked into the Star Saloon at around 10 p.m. The narrow, dimly lit saloon attracted actors, stagehands, and playgoers from Ford's Theater next door. Alone, he drank whiskey. Any customers who recognized the handsomest, best-dressed man in Washington kept it to themselves and did not disturb him. Booth slapped a few coins on the bar and left without saying a word. As he exited into 10th Street, he noticed the president's carriage parked and waiting to take Lincoln back home. In the alley behind Ford's, John Peanut walked Booth's impatient horse back and forth. It was time. Booth entered the theater lobby, listened to the dialogue on stage. He was still on schedule. He climbed the curving staircase to the balcony, following the same path the Lincolns took to their box. He walked slowly along the wall. One theater patron, still hoping to witness General Grant's arrival, looked up from his first floor seat and saw a man approaching the box. He recognized Booth. Booth could see the door of the vestibule, that led directly to the president's box. What he saw, what he did not see, surprised him. The door was unguarded. He expected to see an officer, a soldier, or at least a policeman seated there. Instead, seated near but not blocking the door was Lincoln's servant, Charles Forbes. Booth showed Forbes something. To this day, no one knows what words they exchanged or what Booth showed him. Was it a letter or a calling card? A card with Booth's name on it would open almost any door in Washington. Forbes did not attempt to stop him. Booth turned the knob and pushed open the vestibule door. There was no guard. No one stood between him and the President of the United States. Inside the box, the Lincolns were enjoying themselves, not because of the play, but simply from being together out of the White House during their happiest week in Washington. Seated in his rocking chair, perhaps thinking of the carriage ride that afternoon, Lincoln reached out and held Mary's hand. In pretend embarrassment, Mary scolded her husband for his boldness. What will Miss Harris think of my hanging on to you so? Lincoln replied, 
to the last words he would ever hear his wife speak. She won't think anything about it. He smiled at her affectionately. Booth closed the outer vestibule door behind him so quietly no one heard a thing. Bending down, he felt along the edge of the carpet near the wall for the pine bar, part of a music stand that he had hidden there at that afternoon. No one was watching. When no one was watching, he entered Ford's, sneaked into the vestibule box, and made his preparations. He found the bar, grabbed it with both hands, and wedged it quietly and tightly between the wall and the door. No one could follow him into the president's box. So he's blocked the door so no one can get him. The actor's black eyes adjusted in the darkness. While fixing on the only light in the dim room, a faint pinpoint of light coming from the peephole that someone probably, probably Booth had bore through the panel of the door into the box. Booth peeked through the dot in the light door of light on the door, seeing the interior of the box. Lincoln sat at the far left of the box, closest to Booth in his rocking chair. The left side of the president's box turned toward the audience. He faced the stage now. Mary sat to Lincoln's right, seated in a wood chair. On her right was Clara Harris, and next to her, Major Rathburn, seated on the sofa. Booth would enter the box and shoot Lincoln without having to get past the major. On stage, there were four scenes left before the end of the play. It was around 10 p.m. Booth plunged his hands into his pockets and withdrew his weapons. In his right hand, he held the 44 caliber Derringer pistol, and in his left, the sharp Rio Grande camp knife. The actor, Harry Hawk, entered the stage. It was not time yet. There were too many actors still on stage. Booth listened to the dialogue for the play of the play for the, his signal. In a few moments, Booth knew Harry Hawk would be on stage and would speak a line guaranteed to produce energetic laughter that would drown out the sound of just about anything, including Booth Hope, the sound of a pistol shot. Booth's thumb pulled back the hammer of the Derringer until he heard it cock into firing position. His hand reached for the doorknob. Though he could not see the stage, he could hear the dialogue. Now Booth knew only two actors remained on stage. The tension was unbearable. The dialogue spoken on stage no longer sounded like words, but like the ticks of a dying clock winding down. It was 10.13. This is an image in the book. This is Booth waiting in the... In the back of the room, this here is, is um, Clara Harris. So it's like the president's off over here. And then this is supposed to be Satan continuing to whisper in his ear to um, keep him focused on what he's supposed to do. Once Harry Hawk was on stage, Booth opened the door and stepped into the president's box. Hawk began reciting the last sentence Lincoln would ever hear, a series of corny insults that delighted the audience. Lincoln was so near, if Booth wished to, he could reach out and tap him with the muzzle of the pistol. No one in the box had seen or heard him enter. They all continued to watch the action on stage. Booth began the performance he had rehearsed in his mind again and again. He stepped forward towards Lincoln, raised his right arm to shoulder height, extended the pistol forward. He was so close to the president now that all he had to do was point the derringer. Booth squeezed the trigger. The comic line spoken by Harry Hawk, you scoctologizing old man trap was followed by an explosion of laughter from the audience. The black powder charged, charge exploded and spit the bullet toward Lincoln's head. The muzzle flash lighted the box for a moment like a miniature lightning bolt. Had Booth succeeded. If he had only wounded Lincoln, the president, even at 56 years old, would have been a worthy opponent. The idea of the president fighting back against the young Leaping and sword fighting actor had not was is not a far fet, as far fetched as it sounds. With his creased and wary looking face atop a thin six foot four inch frame, President Lincoln might have looked old and weak. The war had taken his its toll, but beneath his baggy coat and trousers there was a lean and strong body. Too soon doctors would discover and be amazed at the apparent difference in age between his face and his body. Lincoln had not seen Booth coming. The bullet struck him in the head. At the on the lower left side, just below the ear. The ball ripped through his chestnut-colored hair, cut the skin, penetrated the skull, and because of the angle of Lincoln's head at the moment of impact, made a diagonal tunnel through Lincoln's brain. The wet brain matter slowed the ball's speed, absorbing enough of its energy to prevent it from exiting the other side of the skull through the president's face. The ball came to rest in Lincoln's brain, behind his right eye. Lincoln never knew what happened to him. His head dropped forward, his body lost all muscle control, sagged against the chair, rocking chair. 
The sound of the pistol shot hung in the box for several seconds. It traveled to the stage below and echoed through the theater. The pistol shot did startle some of the people in the audience. Some thought it was part of the play. Some did not hear it at all. So remember, he, he did this during this famous funny line. Here's an image of Booth. That's Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln with Booth behind him. Remember, they didn't have cameras at the time, so anything that went into the newspaper was an illustration. I mean, they had cameras, but their newspapers were illustrated. There we go, sorry. Major Henry Rathburn, seated in the box, just feet away from the president, was an experienced army officer, familiar with the sounds of gunshots. He was the first to realize that something was very wrong. He turned to his left. The smoke from the gun, now tinted red from the gas lights, partly blocked his vision. Rathburn rose from his seat and stepped in the direction of the president. At that moment, he saw a wild-eyed man, his face ghostly against his black clothes, hair, and mustache. Like a demon, Booth emerged from the cloud of black powder and sprang at him. Rathburn lunged for Booth, grabbing him by the coat. The assassin broke free, shouting, Freedom! and throwing his right arm as high as it could reach. Rathburn saw what Booth had clenched in his fist, a large, shiny knife, its blade pointed directly out, down at him. At the last moment, Rathburn raised his arm to protect himself from what was intended to be a death blow. The major grunted in pain. His quick defensive move had saved his life, but the blade sliced through his sleeve and into his upper arm. Blood gushed from the deep wound. Booth wasted no more time finishing off Rathburn. The clock in his head was still ticking down. If he was going to escape the theater, he had to get out of the box at once. He swung his leg over the side of the railing at the front of the box. By now, some members of the audience had looked up, seeing a man climbing out of the president's box. As Booth positioned for a leap to the stage, Rathburn came at him again, grabbing his coattail. Thrown off balance, Booth got tangled in the frame framed portrait of George Washington hanging on the front of the box. On one of his riding spurs snagged one of the flags that decorated the box. He managed to free himself and landed off balance but still on his feet. He felt something wrong with his left leg near the ankle but there was nothing he could do about it now. Booth scrambled to center stage, turned to the audience, and stood up straight. Through every, though every second was precious to his es escape, he knew that this was his last appearance on the American stage. This would be the performance he would be remembered for. All eyes were on him. He stood still, paused to build suspense, and thrust his bloody dagger victoriously into the air. The gas stage lights shone on the shiny blade, now stained with blood. Sic semper tyrannis, he thundered. It was the state motto of Virginia, thus always to tyrants. Then Booth shouted, the South is avenged. Harry Hawk, the only actor on stage when Booth made the leap, did not understand what was happening. Hawk, more than anyone else in the theater, was in the best position to hear the shot and see Booth climb into, onto the balcony. Uh, <clears throat> Hawk had known Booth and was not likely to mistake him. Hawk stood directly in Booth's escape path. When Booth had nearly reached him, Hawk fled. As Booth moved across the stage, heading for the wing, one audience member heard him say to himself, I have done it. Booth fled into the wings, slashing his dagger at anyone who got in his way. The orchestra conductor said he felt Booth's hot breath as the assassin pushed past him and struck him, struck at him with the knife. He did not attempt to stop Booth, nor did anyone in the cast try. Booth had taken all the actors backstage by surprise and rushed past them. A voice cried from the president's box, Stop that man! Some in the audience gasped with fright and delight, and they still thought it was part of the play. Will no one stop that man? An anguished Major Rathburn pleaded to the crowd. Clara Harris shouted, he has shot the president. So because of the chaos, nobody knew what was going on and people thought that part of the play was still going on. So here's an image <clears throat> um, that was in the paper. Um, it was published, um, I think Philadelphia. Um, but <clears throat> like they had to go off what eyewitnesses saw. So here's Booth flying through the air. He's about to land on the stage and here's President Lincoln like grasping his head. So obviously this wasn't an accurate um, portrayal of what actually happened. Um, President Lincoln didn't do that. So anyway, that is chapter two and we have one more to go.